there, Rooted Fellowship family. Welcome to Rooted Digital. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to gather again once more on this digital platform. We have a very special Sunday planned for us today. We have Pastor Sikle Klulu from Renewal Fellowship. Uh, he's going to be opening up God's Word for us, and so he's going to be navigating us through God's Word. And so we know you're going to be blessed by that. Please, if you'd like to get in touch with us, if you have any questions, please hang on until the end of the video. Uh, there'll be some connect details there. Alternatively, you can email us at community at rootedfellowship.com for more information about us, about the church, what we believe in. Uh, please head over to www.rootedfellowship.com. We look forward to engaging with you and seeing you soon. Bye. Greetings, uh, Rooted Fellowship. It's always uh, good to uh, come, care, and share God's word. My name is Siche. I have a privilege of leading a church plant in Johannesburg called Renewal Fellowship. And I have a privilege today to bring God's word uh, to us. I know you've been in a series of Mark for a couple of months. Um, so um, I, I get a privilege to bring uh, us in Mark. We are in Mark 13. We're finishing in Mark 13. I think Oni looked at it last week and we're finishing Mark 13 today. What I'm going to do for us, I'm going to read our text and then I'm going to pray for us and then we'll jump back we'll jump back into the text so let's read mark 13 i'll be reading from verse 28 to verse 37 and then i'll pray for us and then we'll jump in let me read for us mark 13 from verse 28 let's hear now god's word it says from the fig tree learn its lesson as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves you know that summer is near so also when you see these things taking place you know that he is near at the, at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each his work, and commands the, the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the ro rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is life. It brings life to us. It brings truth um, to us. So I pray that your word by your spirit will awaken us. Your word will uh, encourage us. Um, Lord, I pray that what we do not know, may you teach us. What we do not have, may you give us. What we are not, may you make us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are looking at this text in Mark 13, and I think from what you, if you've been following or you were at, at church last Sunday, um, or you watched this, uh, or, or you watched the sermon last Sunday, you would know that Oneb picked it up from the, the beginning of Mark 13, uh, and it's all about uh, the destruction of the temple, but also the return of Christ. And today we're going to be focusing more from verse 32 to verse 37, which focuses more on the return of Christ. Now, I do want to say this up front. When we are looking at the portion of the return of Christ and the end of all things, we can fall into some dangers when we are thinking about these things. In fact, we can fall into two dangers when we are thinking about the return of Jesus. We can end up believing uh, more than what the Bible teaches. That's the first one. Or we can end up believing less than what the Bible teaches. So one of those two things, some people fall into these two ditches where you, when it comes to the return of Christ, you end up believing more than what the Bible actually says or you end up believing less. Now, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you might know, you might not know, or may be aware that there has been movements or 
or, or, or groupings within the Christian church or even outside the Christian church that has claimed to know about the details of the return of Christ. Uh, they've been people, I mean, people come year after year with all sort of things about the return of Christ, which will fall in this first category, which they will say more than what the Bible say. But I suspect that me and you, and I'm talking about people here at Rooted Fellowship or people uh, around us, we might not fall into that first ditch. For most of us, we are prone into the second danger. And the danger is don't, we don't believe enough of what the Bible teaches about the return of Christ. We don't think enough about the return of Christ. We don't know enough about the return of Christ. Sometimes we may even think about the, that the second coming or the end of the world, as it were, is, is such a, is a cliché. It's, it's something that we, you know, it, 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 for those, for, for other Christians, not us. You know, we, we, you know, we don't even want to talk about that. We don't want to think about that because we don't want to be labeled as those Christians. When we think about the return of Christ, it is something that is not sophisticated. And we don't want to be among those. And therefore, we really need to check ourselves whether we believe these things. We really need to check ourselves whether we are really believing what the Bible says about the return of Christ. The return of Christ is not an optional uh, doctrine or thinking or teaching when it comes to the Christian faith. It's actually a fundamental teaching about the Christian faith. W one of the documents that were written uh, ages ago of the Christian faith, the fundamentals of the Christian faith, is a document called the Apostles' Creed. And in the Apostles' Creed, it says that we believe as Christians that Jesus will come back to judge the living and the dead. It's a fundamental teaching. Of the Christian faith and the question is do we believe that uh, do we believe that and therefore th listening to this passage will really clear these things out for us and this passage really teaches us very clearly about these things interestingly enough Jesus speaks about his return with the same confidence with the same authority as he spoke about his death actually in the Gospels, he tells his disciples that he was going to die. He, he, he spoke about that as a matter of fact. This was going to happen. I'm going to die. And it happened. And he says to them that he was going to go back to the Father. He told them he was going to go back to the Father and send his spirit. And that's exactly what had happened. And he, tell, he told them and he tells us that he's going to return and he says it the same, with the same authority, with the same matter of fact. Just that about his death, just about his ascension, but also he says that about his return. This is happening. This is happening. Now this chapter and this section began with Jesus talking about the, the, the temple and its destruction, which was a massive thing, a massive thing for, for, for the disciples and the, the Jewish people at the time. And what seems to be clear is that the, this destruction of the temple that was about to happen and actually happened in AD 70, it was almost like a trailer what will one day happen to the whole world. Which is why Jesus put these stories together. He, he, in fact, he, he puts them, he, he intertwines them where sometimes we can't even tell whether he's talking about the, the destruction of the temple here. Is he talking about the return of Christ? He's putting these events, both of them together, just cause for, for us to understand just as this one happened, this one will also happen. Just as this one was a massive, uh, uh, you know, cosmic affair, so is the other one. So we come to our text this morning and we're going to be focusing on verse 32 to verse 37 again as I've, as I've mentioned. And what I liked about this passage is that you don't have to look hard to, to, to see what it's about. You know, sometimes we have to wonder what is this passage about. This one, we don't have to look hard to see what it's about. In, in, in verse 33, Jesus says um, that you know, no one knows about concerning this day. And in verse 33, he says, be on guard, keep awake. He said, keep awake, keep awake. And in verse 35, he says, therefore, keep awake. In verse 37, he says, what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. I think we get the point. Jesus is making it clear 
that the point of this passage is to stay awake. Stay awake. I wonder if you've struggled with that. I wonder if, if any one of us struggle with that staying awake. Uh, I bet someone is actually saying, I'm struggling right now to stay awake. <laughs> actually, you need to wake up and, 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 and watch more of the sermon. But I think we will know the difficulty of staying awake. Maybe, you know, you would be driving a long distance and you get tired and you're just struggling to stay awake. I've been there. I remember actually just, you know, it's a long story. I won't get to it. But I know what it's like not, you know, to try to stay awake. Maybe it's a day when you're trying to, or an evening or a night where you're trying to, to stay awake because you're writing an exam the following day. You need to study the whole night and you struggle to stay awake and you're dozing, dozing off. Uh, staying awake can be difficult. Now, in case you have not noticed or you have not, you're not aware, following Jesus can be similar. Because gospel wakefulness or being awake to Jesus and what he's doing can be a difficult thing. It can be a difficult thing in a world that is extraordinarily good in lulling us to sleep with its glittering edifices and its, and its storytelling, this narrative that is given us, this narrative that we, we get drawn into, staying awake to Jesus and what he's doing can be something that's difficult. Just as difficult as staying awake when you're driving or staying awake when you're trying to, you know, stay awake the whole night. Staying awake as a follower of Jesus, staying awake to the kingdom of God, staying awake as a Christian can be a difficult thing. And we are in a cultural moment where it seems like everything is falling apart. And therefore, even staying awake today, staying awake in 2021 in a cultural moment is actually how we stay awake for the return of Christ. We need to stay awake for what is happening today. Staying awake in our cultural moment today in 2021 is the way we stay awake, is the way we stay awake for the return of Christ. And what's happening right now, the cultural moment we are in, is that everything seems to be falling apart. Everything in our culture. We actually, uh, the, we actually realize that the promise of this Western secular individualism that, that, that is in our culture, that you, that you will be happy as long as you make enough money, find your own self, find sexual freedom, uh, you know, find your own way, find your own truth, that promise is actually not working out. You know, people are actually being awake to that. The promise is not fulfilling its demands and we are all having a collective freak out. We don't know what we do. If we are honest, we don't, with ourselves, we don't know what to do. And everyone is giving us solutions. Everyone is giving us saviors, as it were. And to stay awake as a Christian in that cultural moment can be a difficult thing. But I want to get you into our text and then I'll, I'll get back to exactly what this means for us today. Let me get to our text and then I'll come back to what it means for us today. Now, there are two things that are really happening in our text. Again, you know, looking back in, in, in verse 28 to verse 31, Jesus there is still wrapping up. He's, 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 he's talking about this destruction of the temple and he's talking about there that they will know when it's about to happen. They will know just like the fig tree when it start, you know, the, the, the leaves start coming out and then you know that the summer is near. They, they will know that this thing is about to happen. And he says to them in verse 30 that, that I, I say to you that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place talking about this destruction of the temple. He, he says, you can trust my word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And then he makes this shift in, in verse 32. And then he says, but concerning that day, concerning his coming, concerning that day, no one knows. Now, I want to talk about this in two ways. I wanted to look at it. Why do we need to stay awake? 
But what does it mean to stay awake? Again, remember our text is just about staying awake. So I want to, again, look at it in two ways. Why do we need to stay awake? But also, what does it mean to stay awake? First one, why do we need to stay awake? And the answer that Jesus gives us is very clear. Verse 32 and verse 33. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, know the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. The reason we need to be spiritually alert is because no one knows when the end will come. This is, this is, this is basic. This is clear. Uh, no one knows when the end will come. Now again, it, it, it's been a habit of some Christians and groupings to try and figure this thing out. To try and figure and pinpoint when exactly this will happen. And Jesus gives us reasons why we shouldn't do this and why we can't know. He gives us reasons for that. The first reason he says, it's because no one knows. No one knows. It's pretty clear. No one knows. And some of us, we, we may think that we, we're an exception to this. You know, now and again, people pop up and we say, oh, someone knows. This, this person knows. No, no, no. Jesus says no one knows. It is clear. Not one person knows. That's the first one. And then he, say, he says, secondly, not just no one knows in humanity. Not only that, but not even the angels know. This is not even the angels in heaven know. Now think about all the back passes that the angels get to have. You know, think, think of, 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 of what they get to see that we don't see. Think of what they know that we don't know. You know, they, they've got the, the back pass, you know, you, 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 the, back, the back pass uh, thing that we don't have. But also even with them... Jesus says, with all of that, these guys don't know either. You are not the only one who's cut out of this, but only the, even the heavenly beings, the angels, they don't know. But here's the kicker. Here's the big one. No one knows, not even the angels know, but listen to this one. He says, nor the Son, but only the Father. Not even Jesus, no. Jesus doesn't know himself. No one knows. No, the angels, the angels don't know. And Jesus does not know himself. He says, no, the son, but the father. The eternal son of God himself does not know the details of this day. Does not know when it's happening. Jesus, as the God man, does not know. Now, to be honest, that can be mind-boggling theologically when you think about that. But we should not miss the point here. If Jesus doesn't know the details of this day, if the Father has not told the eternal Son, He's not going to tell any one of us. He's not going to tell you. He's not going to tell the person who claims to know. No one knows. We don't know when it will be. And therefore... That is why I'm, 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 I'm even pulling this out. Therefore, we need to keep, to be on guard and keep awake. That's why Jesus is emphasizing this thing. No one knows, nor the angels, nor Jesus himself. Therefore, stay awake. Therefore, be on guard. Therefore, be alert. But secondly, why, why do we need to stay awake? Why do we need, what does it mean, I mean, to stay awake? We know why we need to stay awake because we don't know. We don't know the day. But what does it mean to stay awake? Jesus gives a parable here in verse 34. He says, It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. He gives this parable. And the only way I could explain this parable for you, for us, is 
think about it this way. I mean, most of us, we, 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 we will know the life of living in complexes, you know, the, the, the complex with a, a gate and someone who's there and, and everyone is sort of within the complex. You, you know, if you live in a complex or you, will, or you know anything about that, you will know that they have people at the gate who deal with access of who's coming in and who's coming out, but at the same time, they deal with security of who shouldn't come in. So these are the, gay, the guys who are there almost uh, 24 hours. They are there for that access, you know, making sure that we are safe. But that's the concept of the doorkeeper in the olden days. Now, in the olden days, you will have people with these big properties or these big mansions or, you know, a big property with, you know, with a big yard and everything. And, you know, you, you sort of drive you know, two kilometers to get into the house from the gate. I don't know if you, you, you've been in, in one of those properties. And, and they would have a doorkeeper. They would have someone at the gate who was doing the same thing that someone in the complex will do. That person will be called a doorkeeper. Again, they are doing the same thing, making sure they're giving access, making sure that they, they have security for those who shouldn't come in. A friend of mine, there's a friend of mine in, in Cape Town who was telling me that some of, some of the expensive apartments or some of the apartments in these expensive areas in, in Cape Town, you know, those ones next to the sea, those are ones that we all wish we, we, we could have, that most of, this, though, most of those properties are actually bought by people overseas, who stay overseas, uh, who come there once in a while. And, and you'll find that you have the whole flat or whole apartment uh, where the people inside there actually don't stay there. They are staying overseas. They come now and then when they need those places. And the doorkeepers, the people who are there at the door who, you know, who give access or security, they actually don't even see the people who occupy those apartments for months or even years because these people own these apartments, don't live there. Some of these guys, they just, you know, sit there, the doorkeepers, they just sit there in empty apartments, not having any human interaction, actually. But they have to sit there and do their work of whatever they need to do to work every day, 24 hours, because they don't know when this person will show up. They don't know when this owner will show up and what would, it, would it be sad if the owner come there and there's no security, there's no one working there because they're paying for this place. And Jesus is saying the same thing there. Here, he, you don't know the day, we don't know the day when he will show up. Let's keep working. Let's keep being alert. Let's stay awake. We are like that doorkeeper. We need to stay awake because we don't know when he will show up. And the time in which we wait is the time we need to be useful to Jesus. Is the time we need to work. That's what Jesus says. He says that the, the doorkeeper in charge, or he, Jesus leaves the servants, he leaves the servants and in charge each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Staying awake is not passive. Staying awake is being useful to Jesus. Staying awake is being faithful with the work he has given us. This is, it's not about living, predicting the future, but living in present faithfulness, in present vocation, in present usefulness. For us is to live with gospel wakefulness, with gospel wakefulness, being aware. We need to know these things, that we need to be awake, we need to be working, we need to be useful to Jesus. And for us to do that, for us to live in that gospel wakefulness, we need to actually know what are the things that get us dozing off. What are the things that get us, that lull us to, to sleep? What are the things that get us dozing off? We need to know these false saviors that lull us to sleep. That we need to know our cultural moment. What are the things that don't keep us that make us not to be awake. We need to live alert and awake in 2021. How does it mean for that? What does it mean for us to be awake, in, to be awake and, and aware of what's happening right now? I, I want to share a few things with us, the, the things that are happening in our culture, 
the, 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 the water that we are swimming in, which makes, us, which makes things difficult for us to be awake to Jesus, for us to be awake as followers of Jesus. The, f- the first one would be that we live, I mean, in, 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 you know, Western, cult- in Western culture or whatever, it's been said that, you know, people are living in a post- post-Christian culture. I mean, for us, it's not entirely post-Christians, but there's a sense of, I would say, the semi-post-Christian culture, meaning that no one assumes Christianity anymore. No one assumes that people are Christians. No one assumes that, you know, on Sundays people go to church, all of those things. Actually, people are shocked that you are a Christian. When you, when you talk to them at work or whatever, they, they are taken back. It's not assumed anymore. And therefore, so they, there's a gravitational pull towards the culture that we are swimming in. The, 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 the pull is very strong. The pull is very strong for us to go with the current wave of what's happening around us. The pull to say, why go to church? It's Sunday. Everyone is going jogging. Everyone is going for a, a, a run for whatever is happening. Everyone is having a braai. Everyone is going for drinks. And you're going to church? There's a pool there. Why go to church? Let's just go for beers and hang out. That's what everyone is doing. There's a pool to ignore what Jesus and the New Testament say about sexuality and marriage. It's a pool. And some of us are falling asleep to that. There's a pool to give in to the rampant consumerism and buy the jacket number 20 that you don't need. That's what our culture is doing. There's a pool for us. The pool to go with the flow of the culture that we are around. The pool to get sucked in. The pool to fall asleep. But also, we don't just live in this post-Christian culture. We live in a modern society. In this modern society, in a modern society, there's something good about it. There's something not good about it. The pros and cons. I love the fact that I didn't ride a horse coming here. You know, it's a modern society. I drove. But also, there, there are negatives. That, that We live in this digital age where there's constant digital distraction. Where, where, where your phone has become part of your humanity. You have a profile somewhere that knows what you're doing, that, that feeds you information, that tells you what to do as you wake up. This digital age allows us to sleep to Jesus. But also we live in this hyper-individualistic society where we ache for, cum- for community, but at the same time, loneliness is the plague that is in our society. Where we are hyper-connected, but we don't have real community. We live in this world or this society where biz- business is the order of the day. Everyone is busy. I mean, I remember growing up, you know, you, there were special people who were busy. There were people that we knew, oh, this person, he's an executive somewhere, she's an executive, whatever. They, you know, people with the pages in the old days, they were the busy people. But today, everybody's busy. And all of that are those things that are taking us to sleep. Being a healthy human being in this cultural moment, let alone being a healthy disciple of Jesus, is difficult. We are all struggling. We're just being healthy people, let alone being healthy followers of Christ. All of these things, they draw us to sleep. They lull us to sleep. What are, the, some of the, what, what are the ways for you that is happening? What are the things that are drawing you to sleep to Jesus? Are you going with the current of the culture, even with the things that I've just mentioned? And some of the ways that you you can tell, what are the ways that you can tell that you are dozing off? You can tell that you are dozing off and falling asleep to Jesus and his ways and his return is when you are staying in the same place spiritually. This is one of the ways you can tell actually that you are dozing off, meaning that you are not growing as a Christian. Would you say that you are growing as a Christian? Honestly, are you growing in prayer? Are you growing in your Bible intake? 
Are you growing in your love together with God's people? Are you growing in sharing your faith? Are you growing in holiness? Yes, I said holiness. Or have you stopped doing what you used to do? Are you falling asleep on the spiritual will, as it were? Are you falling asleep? And Jesus says to us today, wake up. Jesus is gracious enough to come to your couch, to, to, to come to you today and say, you are falling asleep, you are dozing off. There used to be a day when you were awake. There used to be a day when you, you, you were amazed of the ways and, 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 the, and, and the kingdom of God, but you are dozing off. You, you used to love to grow in Christ, but it's not a priority anymore. You used to love to gather with God's people, but it's not a priority anymore. You used to love your Bible, but it's not a priority anymore. You have dozed off. And Jesus, in His grace, is saying to you, stay awake. How do I stay awake? You, you may ask. Be in Christian community. Be in Christian community. Opening up yourself for accountability. It's not use being in community when you don't open up yourself. Opening up yourself to accountability. Persevere in spiritual practices. In your prayer life. In your Bible intake. In your, in your worship. In your gathered worship. Gathered worship is one of the crucial ways for our discipleship. Don't sleep on that. Revive yourself at the beauty of the gospel. Remember when the gospel used to be a beautiful thing? It used to be this amazing thing? Have you fallen asleep even at the beauty of the gospel? Are you still in awe of the gospel, the glorious gospel? The fact that, that you were once dead in your sins. The fact that you were once asleep to the things of God. But God, by His grace and through His Spirit, He made you alive. He woke you up. That the work that He accomplished on the cross, He has now applied in your life through His Spirit. And He's coming again to redeem everything. He's coming again to fully consummate his kingdom and you are caught up in that. You are caught up into what God is doing in this world. You are caught up in this, in this narrative that, and the story that God is writing in this world because he has drawn you to himself. Are you still awake to that? Are you still in awe of the gospel? Here's the thing. If you love the gospel, if you love what Jesus has done, there is no falling asleep at the foot of the cross. There is no way you can fall asleep at the, fall, at the foot of the cross when you know what Jesus has done for you. Stay awake. Stay there. Stay at the foot of the cross. Keep your eyes on Christ. Jesus says, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep, stay awake. And I want to say to those of us who, who, who are actually saying, I mean, I don't even know what this is about. I'm not a Christian. Maybe you just, you know, someone has dragged you to watch this. If you don't know Christ, his return is not good news for you right now. His return is not good news for you because where is your hope? When you think about the return of Jesus, is that something that excites you? Where is your hope when you think about that? And even with you, Jesus is he's, he's pleading, he's saying, wake up today to the goodness of God. Wake up today and trust him and put your faith in him. Wake up today to the news of the gospel. But also this passage says to all of us, for, for those of us who are also Christians, we don't know the hour. Therefore, let's not doze off. Let us stay awake. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your care. We thank you that you are gracious enough to wake us up in our sleep. Lord, I pray that your word will do a work in our lives, that we won't just be hearers of your word, we will be doers of your word. Wake us up, we pray, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.